During the 40 days of Lent, the Christian church prepares to observe the Lord's passion and resurrection. We examine ourselves as we remember the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In the season of repentance and fasting, we come to terms with our mortality and the need for God's mercy. The candles around this cross represent Jesus' life and ministry. Each week, we extinguish another candle as we draw closer to that dark day of crucifixion. John 13, 21 through 30. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should, be, she, he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was not. We extinguish the sixth candle as we remember Judas' betrayal of Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Holy God, during this season of Lent, we have asked that you would purify our hearts and minds. Help us grow in love for you. Make our commitment to your mission even deeper. Give us the grace when we fail so we might seek first your good, true, and peaceful kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. We'll be listening this morning to Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, beginning there with verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May God add God's blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Holy God, in this time of unique circumstances, help us, Lord, as we worship with one another from separate places to hear what you would have us to hear. That, Lord, in this time we may do what you call us to do. And though we are scattered, Lord, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now here we are, just a few short days away from what is likely to be the most unique of that morning, that Easter morning, when we will hear the proclamation of those women from 2,000 years ago telling us that a tomb which once held a corpse now stands empty. We're within earshot of those words of their words, of their terror and amazement. But we are also within earshot of those who shouted, Hosanna! When the beast bearing the Lord tread across those palm branches and cloaks on its way into the city of Jerusalem. The final step on Jesus' journey this side of resurrection. We're within earshot of that quiet, covert conversation struck up by the Sanhedrin and the one who would betray his friend. 
We are within earshot of the sound of pouring wine and breaking bread, the sloshing water as Jesus ate his last supper with his friends and washed their feet. We are within earshot of marching soldiers, the sound of swords being drawn, of hands slapping faces and chains dragging the ground. We're close enough to hear the voices that on this day cry, Hosanna! Change their song to the crude chorus, Crucify Him! We're close enough to hear the crack of the whip, the tearing of flesh, the reverberating thud of timber being dragged and dropped, the resounding metallic clap of iron being driven through flesh and bone into wood. And we can even hear the groans, the cries of those three whose bodies are raised up before a crowd of onlookers as the burdens of their body and the weight of their fates make it difficult to breathe. We're within earshot of those words Jesus would utter from the cross. Words that reach their crescendo in the cries of the psalmist, Ile, Ile, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're able to hear even today the last breath as it leaves the lungs of the Son of God. We call this Palm Sunday, but it has another name, Passion Sunday. And on this Passion Sunday, we are within earshot of all of those things that will transpire this holy week. Yet this morning, we hear something different on the air, something, something that perhaps seems more at home, not at the sight of a crucifixion, but in an hour of worship. This morning, we've heard a hymn. Now, I'm not talking uh, about any of those hymns that we would sing together in, in this room when we are together. I'm, I'm talking about one of the oldest hymns of our faith. And no, that's not amazing grace. It's the hymn found in our passage from Paul's epistle to his beloved Philippians. It's a hymn Paul weaves so masterfully into his letter to his most beloved congregation. It's a hymn that speaks of the self-emptied Christ, of his endless obedience even to the point of death, the cruelest death on a cross. It is a hymn that highlights, highlights the exaltation of this selfless Christ and exaltation that leads to universal worship, complete confession. It's a grand hymn that has stood through the ages and languages of the church, preserved in the words of one of Christ's apostles to one of Christ's churches. Scholars even have a name for it. They call it the kenosis hymn. That Greek word kenosis meaning emptied. And it's a hymn Many of you heard, have heard, no doubt, at least a time or two, maybe not set to music, but you've heard it. As with many hymns we sing these days, too often I think we sing them or hear them, but we really don't listen to them. Sure, we know the words, but have those words found a place to land in our hearts and minds? A place where those words will then begin to transform us. Not just a tune we hum, but words that go deep. Far too often, the words of hymns, the power contained in their beautiful lyrics, is lost on us as we find ourselves just simply singing along as if the worship of God in song was little more than elevator music, a nice little melodic distraction to get us through an otherwise awkward period of time and out the door. But with this hymn, and honestly, I hope the hymns that we sing together in worship, especially now that we've been without one another to sing them. With this hymn, I want us to take a moment to really listen to the words. Allow them to be more than mere 
vibrations in the air that tickle our eardrums to find the eternal truth there in these words. Because you see, the words of this hymn in Paul's epistle to the Philippians are words that speak to the truth of what transpires in this week, in the events of that first holy week. Christ, the incarnate God, Paul says, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Jesus was not simply some mortal man with bad luck of being singled out by God for a holy suicide mission. No, Jesus was, is, and will always be God in the flesh. The second person of the Trinity. Yet rather than divinely hovering above the filth of this world, God in Christ walked upon the ground the same way you and I do. Rather than some cosmic show of power and might, rather than some grand spectacle of destruction of all that is wicked, God in Christ quietly arrived in a barn in some backwater town called Bethlehem. He lived the life of one born into the lower class of society. He knew the taste of sweat, the sting of sore and cramped muscles, and the feeling of a hard day's work. He felt joy and sorrow. He felt hope and fear. And he did all of this despite being the eternal creator of the universe in the flesh. Being in the flesh, Jesus, Paul says, was obedient to the call of God, the work of the kingdom he proclaimed as he lived, moved, and even ate among the sinners of this world. And rather than taking some, hiddenly, some hidden heavenly highway off this rock, Jesus' obedience to God's call led him straight to death. Death in the cruelest fashion. In short, Paul says, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In his humility, in his self-emptying, his kenosis, Christ was obedient to the God to the point of death itself. This is no all-powerful deity flexing his planet-sized muscles in order to avoid the pain and torment of crucifixion. This is not a, a God who is absent at the time of suffering, who, who comes into a body only to leave it when the nails pierce his flesh. This is a benevolent God, unequaled and unopposed in the universe, who willingly lays down his life for the sake of the universe he created. The world he loves. And the result of this obedience, the result of Christ's selfless death, is exaltation. The result of Christ's self emptying act for all of humanity is the uplifting and magnifying of his name. This is what Paul says in the song. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus does not deserve this sort of exaltation, worship, and confession because he has used godly powers in order to strike fear into the hearts of human worshipers. Jesus has not gained a name worthy of universal confession because he's put sinners in their place, drawn circles around those who are in and those who are out. Jesus has a name worthy of confession because he has put himself in the sinner's place, in our place. Christ is not exalted because he sits on a cloud, lightning bolt in hand, waiting to strike us down at the first sight of misbehavior. Christ's name is not lifted above every name because he is God that separates the, the good, clean, wholesome folks from the bad, dirty, unpleasant folks. Christ is exalted, given the name above every name, 
Because He is the God who shows power in weakness, in humility, grace in excess of our sins, and unending, unfailing, unfathomable love. With that kind of power in such a short hymn, it's a wonder we don't set it to music and sing it every single Lord's Day in church. Maybe we should. Maybe when we come back together, one of you at home will have worked out how to sing it together in English, and we'll do that. Maybe we should. But before we call for a benediction, there's something we've overlooked. Something in these verses of Scripture before us we've yet to address. You see, this hymn in Paul's letter it is a wonderful word on the self-emptying power of Christ. It's a glorious hymn expressing the glory of the God whose power lies in weakness, in humility, whose strength is found, Paul says, in human weakness. It is a hymn praising the God whose love for us is so deep, so wide, that the same God who would take on flesh and all the trappings that come with humanness and suffer the torture and the cruelest of deaths and crucifixion. Yet what I'm afraid we miss, what we so often overlook, especially as, as well, relatively privileged, comfortable people, is Paul's small introduction to this portion of a hymn in verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. You see, we'll sing hymns about the wonderful grace of Jesus. We'll read Scripture about the humble way Jesus encountered people like Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman at the well, or all those who came to mourn the death of Lazarus. We'll rejoice in the light of resurrection morning and the power that came through the death of Christ on a cross. And we'll praise all the wonderful things we claim God has done for us and will do for us. But I wonder... In the midst of all of that rejoicing, all that praising, all that hope for bigger and better things for ourselves, do we heed Paul's command? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It's easy, I suppose, to get caught up with that in this season, this act of salvation from God and what it means for you, maybe even more so now as you are at home or in isolation by yourself with your family. I suppose it's an easy thing to get lost in this sort of time and all that Christ has done for you and yours and see it as some eternal transaction that benefits you in the end. And I suppose it may even be easy for some to look upon what Christ has done and think to themselves, I'm glad he did that so I don't have to do anything. There are, however, the words of Holy Scripture, words from the Apostle Paul calling us to more than mere gratitude. Words that call us to more than a simple recognition that God has decided to give us a chance to get out of hell. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. These words from the Apostle Paul are words that command us to live a life that mirrors the mind of God. In other words, while this is a lovely hymn about all that Christ has done for us, it is a hymn that calls us to the kind of life Christ desires from us. Far too often, I think, we can approach our faith as some sort of one-and-done transaction, some economy of salvation. It's as if they say, as if we say, Jesus paid it all, so I'm on a gravy train with biscuit wheels. No need for me to worry about anything else ever again. I even saw a meme on social media of someone in a choir robe that said, you tell Sally Mae, Jesus paid it all. But too often, I've seen so-called Christians who show up for church, sit on committees, 
give their money and show, show up for Sunday school yet still act as if the only person in the world that matters is me. As if Christ's death, resurrection serves as some sort of substitute for our responsibility to strive for a selfless life fit for the kingdom of God. It's why I'm hesitant to ever suggest, as I've heard others say, to take that most famous passage we talked about not too long ago, John 3.16, to say, For God so loved, not the world, but me, that He gave His only Son. Because it can become a little too focused on me. Christ Jesus, who though He was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It is the mind, the heart, the spirit of this Christ that we have been called to have. It is awful difficult to have the mind of Christ when you are consumed by fear and anxiety, by your own pride, your own sense of worth, your own agenda. It's awful difficult to have the mind of Christ when you seek to undermine the work of the kingdom of God or when you strive to create turmoil in the lives of others simply because of your own sense of superiority. It's difficult to have the mind of Christ when you disregard the safety of others for your, own, for your own purposes. It's impossible to have the mind of Christ when we are anything but self-emptying, humble, and obedient to the love of God. The call to Christian discipleship, the call to being, as we heard from the third chapter of John, being born again or born from above, is a call to selflessness. A call to empty ourselves, our whole self, for the sake of others. Not for the sake of glory, recognition, exaltation, or power. Not for any other sake, but for the sake of others. The call to follow Christ is the call to love others. Not because you want their admiration, not because you want their love in return, but because the immeasurable, unmerited love of God overflows from our spirit. Because when the love of God abides within you, when you have the mind of Christ, you cannot help but have a selfless love for others. So, as the Apostle Paul says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptying himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May you empty yourself of all of those things that serve only you, that keep you, even in these moments of isolation, from experiencing the fullness of God. May you be, may you be obedient to the call of love. Even if it leads you through difficulties, even if it brings you to the point of death, even if it brings you to do things to encounter people, Maybe you don't want to on your own. In this time when we are all together separately, may we have the same mind as Christ. May we seek to leave more of us behind as we take hold of more of who Christ is. And my prayer for you in this time and my prayer for me for all of us is that we may find ourselves 
coming to the place where we have the same mind that is in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, help us to have the same mind that is in you. In these times of isolation when we're apart, but Lord, all the more when we are together. Help us, even in the beginning of this holy week, strange and unusual as it is going to be, help us to have the same mind that is in you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.